Good morning, Hunter King. It's very nice to meet you this morning. Uh, my name is Betsy O'Hagan, and I manage web and marketing for Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, a, a nonprofit uh, chapter of the National Audubon Society in the greater Cleveland area. Um, so, Hunter, um, you will be speaking, you're a guest and a speaker uh, at the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society's member meeting and speaker series. Um, in uh, on Tuesday, November 3rd, and uh, you will be talking about emergent mechanics of the cup nest and its mechanical synthesis. Now, Dr. King, um, you are at the University of Akron, um, and so it's so nice to have you with us here. Could you tell us a little bit about who you are and where you are and what you're doing? Okay. Uh, so I, I am assistant professor in the departments of polymer science and biology at the University of Akron. I'm part of the Biomimicry Research and Innovation Center. So like uh, my, my background is entirely in physics. Um, I studied uh, non-equilibrium physics, experimental tabletop physics as a graduate student, but then worked on um, biological systems, understanding the physical mechanisms underlying uh, functional processes in the ventilation of a termite mound, and one of the topics we're also interested in is how do uh, birds, for instance, manipulate the granular mechanics uh, um, of these filamentous materials? How do they bring materials together to create an emergent structure that's both disordered but has many functions? Um, so that's something we're continuing in my lab now. Oh, that sounds really interesting. I love how you bridge um, physics and um, mechanics um, to learn more from nature uh, about different principles, I would assume, in structure and construction. Can you tell us a little bit more about all of the different areas of a design that come into the work that you do? Right, so we, we're working, um, we're trying to understand the fundamental points about how you can bring elements together to create a material that has properties that are unlike any of those individual elements. So this is something that has broad application in engineering, but we're kind of far away from the applications and more close to the, the fundamentals. Um, the thing that's notable from the perspective of design is that in modern design and engineering, typically we want to prescribe exactly how each element will combine, where we end up varying weights, and how joints are going to be, you know, have their structural integrity. Um, the alternative way, which is actually common for uh, vernacular architecture, is to use materials in a way that we don't really understand prescriptively, but we have an emergent, you know, strength and material properties that we can count on even though we don't understand them. So people did this a long time ago and birds are doing something like this now, but physicists that should understand how you combine materials and get uh, an, a, a predictive property from them, um, they don't. They don't understand that. So that's where we're trying to use the inspiration from, from how birds uh, construct nests um, to understand the fundamentals better. Oh, that's really interesting. I heard you say that you are a um, part of a special program at the University of Akron. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the, the program or the, the center started a few years ago. I was one of the earlier hires through it. And the, the, main, the main premise is that there is a lot to be understand, understood about how nature finds solutions and a lot that can be translated towards human applications. A lot of this has relevance within sustainability um, and the only way to approach it is through very interdisciplinary methods. So the hiring through this program was always deliberately putting people um, in positions to straddle departments and disciplines so we can look at topics and understand them from different angles. Um, the, the center is manifest mostly through the fellowship programs. So students have their own funding for the PhD. They're supported by uh, um, sponsors from the area and industry. 
Um, and we also have a seminar series and, uh, and collaborations. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I see in one of the descriptions of your talk, um, if I can, uh, one of the questions in the description is, how do birds choose elements in order to tune the mechanical performance in aggregate? Can you, ex can you tease that out for us and tell us what that means? Yeah, okay, so there's uh, birds, I guess as the audience knows better than me, they do many, many different things with materials. Um, and what we're trying to address is a subset of them. So the, the birds that do seem to have a particular behavior by which they take, they identify some materials um, that are filamentous. So either they're sticks or they're reeds, and they will choose pieces of them and bring them back to add to a structure and then put it together as if the structure is gradually getting bigger. They, they're doing some kind of evaluation of what that material is as they're choosing it and somehow are anticipating through some intuition or some just practice behavior how it's going to play a role in a structure that is very disordered. So that's exactly what a granular physicist would like to be able to do. I mean, this is sort of going back a few, couple hundred years when people were just understanding how grains would actually pack in a silo. Um, how the, the weight is stored within a grain silo is, is very far from trivial. Um, but we're still at a point of understanding only how a granular material, which is made up of a bunch of large particles, is something that's like a solid but sometimes is like a fluid. We don't know how to make the connection between the elements that compose a structure like a bird's nest and how the bird nest is going to behave altogether. So that's, that's what we want to know. How do they know how to do this and we don't? Wow, wow. I see another question is um, how do distinctive mechanical characteristics relate to structural demands of natural nests? Right. So uh, often I've, I've heard it posed before that you can take, say, composite structures with filaments and get something that is particularly strong per the amount of weight that you have. And that's one way of measuring it, but it seems that the, the demands from the perspective of a bird for the nest is a lot more nuanced than this. Um, so the nest can be relatively soft, but it has to not fall apart. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a strong thing. If you press on it, it doesn't deform. It can actually deform, deform okay, but it seems that the, the functional property is, is more important that it doesn't actually fall apart when the wind is blowing on it or it's, the bird is sitting down uh, repeatedly. It has to retain a structure. And additionally, that structure has to manage thermoregulation and respiration too. So <laughs> somehow they they put this together with a structure with mechanical characteristics that we don't understand very well. Um, it's sort of a, 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 a sort of a toughness, but also it has to have these other functionalities built in. Wow, that's that's so incredible. Well, thanks to the genius of nature uh, and evolution uh, over so many millions of years. Um, could you talk just a little bit, you mentioned very briefly that part of your program is associated or could you tell us more about your program and its association with biomimicry and, and what goes on in our greater region of Northeast Ohio, what's happening in the field of biomimicry. Can you tell us a little bit more about biomimicry? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in some ways not the ideal spokesman for all of biomimicry. They've got a lot of different angles. There is a lot of apl applied biomimicry that is happening. I mean, people wanting to solve a particular problem and then going to nature to see who does this better and how can we actually translate this. And there's a whole design space to that process. Um, so for me, as not a designer, um, it's, it's sort of a, the other side of the spectrum of biomimicry. Um, where we play a role, I figure, is in trying to look at the biological system as it is and understand the, the fundamental uh, physical um, lessons to be learned so that we can abstract them in a way that somebody else can pick them up. So if it is a matter of the granular mechanics that's, you know, in a bird's nest, then someone looking for a solution that involves uh, disordered materials that are 
renewable and reconfigurable, then we can say, well, here's what we've learned from, uh, from Bird's Nest, and then it can find its application eventually. Yes, wow. And so uh, um, I can only imagine how many bazillion aspects of, of biomimicry uh, exist. Um, hmm. And I'm sure we probably only tap into a very, very, very small percentage of, of nature's intelligence. Um, so that's really wonderful. Um, so what, um, what may I ask, what other areas do you work on uh, in, in your work? Yeah, so there, we are spread across, I mean, different biological systems. Um, mm -hmm. Usually we're attracted to problems in which it seems like there should be a relatively simple explanation, but it's hiding between a lot of complicated uh, details, which is what a lot of biological systems are like. So there is, a, we're, we're interested in, you know, a whole field that we're interested in is um, atmospheric water harvesting. Mm -hmm. um, so this is how, how animals actually obtain or how animals and plants get water when it's not actually coming down as rain or passing over or near them, you know, as a, as a river. Um, so there is processes by which um, animals and plants can take in vapor and store it without losing it in a way. And there's process by which uh, certain animals will actually intercept fog as it's blowing in the wind. And how shape and mechanics are actually assisting in that process is something we're interested in. Um, we're also interested in some of the, the fine details inside contact mechanics as it relates to underwater bioadhesion, for instance. Um, some of that is very chemical, which we don't deal with, but some of it is very much dynamics of how two things come into contact. Mm -hmm. And there are subtleties in this topic that we are still, you know, humans are, are still not quite getting their heads around, but a lot of natural systems like, say, a mussel or a gecko have figured out how to manipulate the tiny scale interactions and the flow mm -hmm. in order to serve their purposes. So we're, we're trying to look at those type of things, too. Wow, that sounds fascinating. Um, can you tell us anything more about um, the work you do and its importance to different challenges that humans face today on the Earth, especially in our current challenging times having to do with um, a viral distribution? Uh, yeah, right. And, well, uh, so, and water. Um, uh, Certainly, the, the having access to water. Yep, water is going to be a really, really big problem soon, and so it seems that there's a million different ways we're going to have to approach this, depending okay. on the geography in which it needs to be solved. So the fog harvesting is only going to be useful in certain locations, um, right. and. You know, the vapor harvesting or, or uh, vapor moisture recapture is going to be have, is going to have to be uh, employed in other places. Um, the virus we've also been very um, keyed in on recently because um, of the topic of aerosol transmission. Yes. And this is very much a question of how does a droplet actually reach a surface? And we've been doing experiments on this topic for the sake of, of fog capture, which is very much the subtleties of how do you get a droplet to actually try to touch you. And it's not easy. And it's way more difficult if that droplet is very small. So this is a, a message that seems like we've been thinking about a lot is filtration of very small things is obviously a lot harder. And a lot of what we were talking about earlier as this whole uh, narrative has continued about how much airborne is this problem, um, it seemed like it was missing important points of the aerosol science because people are not very uh, sensitive to what it means for these tiny droplets to be moving around in the air and, you know, potentially being inhaled. Um, this is quite a tangent from, I guess, what I was talking about before. But the, the fact that natural systems have um, had a reason to, even if they're not aware of them, they have a reason to be interacting with with water and with energy um, toward their own fitness um, without having to abstract all of the science. So it makes sense that the, the natural systems are already going to have the insights built in. 
Um, so if there's a system in which you're trying to filter extremely small particles out of the air or out of the water, how they do it is likely going to be um, involving things that we have not thought of. And perhaps the science is not completely there yet. Right. Well, thank you for that explanation and also helping us to further see, you know, the, um, the utter interactivity and interconnectivity of everything that's alive and within living systems. So uh, thank you for your wonderful work. Um, and, you know, we just never know how the work we do uh, can be vital to something that we're really not aware of yet. Um, um, I'd like to just close with one question. Is there anything um, that's particular in your work uh, related or relative to uh, um, ornithological interests or not? But can you tell me anything about that, uh, about what you see for the future? Is there anything in your work that, that really is, um, that you're really very passionate about or um, that you feel is, is an important message to communicate? Yeah, so I guess there are two different things. There, there's the thing that the, the more disciplinary topics that inter interest me just fundamentally I mean, they are very simple things about how to how do bodies interact with each other, what is pushing on what within a system, how do things really get done, the nuts and bolts of a biological system or whatever. That's that's the thing that always interests me on day to day. But the larger message that comes to mind um, that seems kind of more important and relevant to interdisciplinary study is um, that I have, I have a concern about how higher education goes now and where people are becoming, how people are becoming interested in science that can become more and more cynical. Um, people, I mean, there's a reason for people to be wanting to be more transactional about how they study uh, science or how they become in, involved in a career. And it's, it seems to me that there, it's very important that there's always some mental space that's left aside just to be inspired by something that you see and not know where it's going exactly. Um, if, if this is a, considered a tangent from getting to the bottom line, then it's probably one that has always been the source of you know, more value in the end. Um, so I feel like the more people can be, um, you know, have the screens put away and have more time, I mean, I guess this is what birders know very well, probably more than people like me, being outside and just kind of participating and being aware of what's going on is probably where those moments of greater inspiration and uh, value come from. I hope that can happen more often with the, you know, younger generations. I, well, I certainly agree with you. That's, um, that's the great space of, of bringing our human intelligence and our potential to recognize possibility and to uh, thank goodness for nature. Nature helps us to maintain a healthy cultivation of awareness um, so, th so that we can um, be more aware to, to about possibilities and through reflection. Well, thank you so much for taking a little bit of your time today. We really appreciate it to talk about, um, to introduce us to you and your, your important work. Uh, and we look forward to learning more from you um, about the emergent mechanics of the cup nested and its mechanical synthesis um, on Tuesday, November 3rd. So thank you so much, Dr. King. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful to have you here working at the University of Akron. Take care, and we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, thank you. Bye.